Ode on Melancholy. Though you should build a bark of dead men's bones and rear a phantom gibbet for a mast, stitch shrouds together for a sail with groans to fill it out, blood stained and aghast. Although your rudder be a dragon's tail, long severed, yet still hard with agony, your cordage large uprootings from the skull of bald Medusa, certes you would fail to find the melancholy, whether she dreameth in any isle of leafy dull. No, no, go not to leafy, neither twist wolfsbane tight rooted for its poisonous wine, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade, ruby grape of proserpine. Make not your rosary of yew berries, nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. For shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. But when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop-headed flowers all and hides the green hill in an April shroud, then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave or on the wealth of globed peonies, or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu, and aching pleasure nigh, turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. I, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. Though seen of none, save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. His soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung. Um, uh, let me start with a question uh, for you, which is, why would anyone want melancholy? Why would anyone want to be melancholy or find melancholy? How can anyone avoid it? Well, True, <laughs> true, but but here, but this is a poem about wanting it, looking for it, trying to find it. Well, it 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 allows you to live with the miseries and the awfulness of life without depression. Oh, put it up. Say it. Say it out loud. I'm sorry. Someone was saying something. Oh, was it Jim? Yeah. No, Ellen. Maybe if you're 34 and dying of tuberculosis, uh, melancholy comes to mind, unbidden. 24. 24, yeah. 24, excuse me. And he didn't know he was sick yet. 
there's something satisfying about it. Like, what's distressing isn't really a negative emotion. It's a mismatch between emotion and world. If you're in it, you know, it famously feels kind of good to wallow. Um, there's, and it could also be social. It could be something like an excuse to quiet down. You might also have had the experience that the, the contrast of the darkness and the light amplify each other. He might have had the experience where uh, even the threat of losing a deep love makes you then value that love uh, as if maybe, you know, as I said, one is necessary to give the other definition. Toward the end of his great essay, Morning in Melancholia, Freud says some people eroticize depression or melancholy it had it becomes a kind of desirable companion uh see, so he seems to be acknowledging what keats is talking about though jim could probably correct me in that <laughs> i i think he's saying i don't know don't tune out don't go to the oblivion and the and and be out of it even if it's melancholy and but he redefines melancholy also. So, but I think he's saying stay with, stay in the present moment. It's kind of sort of Buddhist. There's um, definitely a religious interaction here. There's the religion of his time. There's the hope of resurrection. I think he's going more for the pagan than the Christian um, response or seeking of melancholy um let me let me throw another question at you because i i i think i think this is at least in part a literary issue and um have any of you ever enjoyed horror movies Anyone like to go to horror movies? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's related, Lloyd. I think it's it's fun. You know, there's an element of it that is just plain fun. Melancholy is fun if you look at it in one way because it's part of the gloriousness of being alive. And there's a little way you can you can glut your sorrow. You can you can experience excess. You know, and, and like watching a horror movie when you're actually wanting to be scared in a controlled environment, you can want to have melancholy, not, not despair, not a wish for death, but something in before you get that far along the road. Well, some kind of controlled um, kick out of... Um, out of the the pleasure of being scared or or upset and knowing that it's really it's a car, kind of artificial um uh that it's a kind of artificial situation it's like being on a roller coaster yeah yeah uh, yeah I, 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 that sort of thing that you 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 feel scared but that it's also very entertaining and that it and that and that there is some sort of control over over that um uh over that experience that that enjoyable experience that we do there is something in in us in people that kind of like to have that charge like to have that um, um, excitement uh, and the excitement of feeling uh, the excitement of feeling scared, even knowing maybe especially knowing that it's it's really not going to do um, 
it's not going to do any harm. It's just going to be fun. It'll just be over with um, once it's over. And um, in in Keats's time, certainly at the oh Denise, sorry, yeah. Thank you. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand in the chat thing. Um, <laughs> I seems, saw you. Yeah, it seems to me that we are not all, we don't have an agreed definition or idea of what melancholy is here. Um, and that we're talking, we may be talking about different things because I can't see what um, the, you know, the, oh, uh, the feelings aroused by a horror movie have to do at all with melancholy. I, I think, you know, that, that fear is different. And somebody, and it might have been David Donna, somebody said earlier in the conversation that feeling melancholy is an alternative to depression. And I think that's onto something that if you, if you, can, if you can feel your intense sadness in the moment, you don't dull it down to a you know, to a perpetual state of, of uh, depression where, where your senses are kind of dulled. Melancholy, I think, is, is more intense and in the moment, but I don't know, we've got a psychiatrist in the room who quoted Freud. Maybe we can, maybe we can <laughs> clarify what we mean by, by uh, melancholy so we can relate it, try to relate it to what relate it to what we think Keats is saying. Um, there's, a, there's a famous book, um, it's at 17th century, uh, Burton's uh, Anatomy of Melancholy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, am, am I, oh, uh, am I, am, does someone want to correct me about the date? I'm. Um, uh, there, there was a passion when Keats was growing up, and even even earlier than that, in in the in the eighteenth century, there was a passion for um, some of the most popular books uh, were really, uh, were kind of horror stories. And, uh, and it became, um, it became a passion in poetry uh, as well. And that there was a, um, uh, uh, a, an effort on the part of writers and usually, um, for the most part, not not the great writers, but the popular writers. Um, to uh, I, I I think in a very similar way uh, to what we have uh, that we uh, to what we have today, that there is a um, you know we 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 get a we get a kick out of these things out of feeling out of these feelings of, um, uh, of, 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 of horror or artificial sadness, um, uh, a soap opera, um, um, something that, um, I don't know, allows us to, uh, to, to get these, uh, uh, feelings out of our out of our out of our system um, uh, for pleasure and and um, and it seems to me what Keats is and and what what the challenge of this particular poem is is that it's really it's a kind of um, literary criticism of Keats's own time. And that what's behind this poem <coughs> um, is the sense that um, 
if you're really if you're really serious about having a deep experience having a profound experience with melancholy with tragedy with loss um um uh that um that there is um there is a deeper experience um uh than the sort of trivial cultural experience of um of um doing it for kicks of doing it for entertainment and that the that there is um that melancholy or the, at least this phrase melancholy this word melancholy that kind of exists on more than one level on a kind of popular level but also on a kind of psychological level on a kind of uh, philosophical level, uh, what so, what so many of you were saying before about how we 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 need some of these feelings that we might you know might 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 say well they're not exactly pleasant feelings, but that we require them, uh, and that we find them in places in unexpected places um so yeah uh, denise i think you 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 had a you had a little uh comment comment about the uh about the drop about the dropped stanza and um uh in 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 that stanza Keats is actually referring more to the cliches of that kind of popular culture. That is, um, uh, I mean, and since some of the language is 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 very much uh, sort of 18th century language, it's even old fashioned in in Keats's own time. Uh, build a, a boat made out of dead men's bones uh rear a a a a a a a phantom gibbet for a mast uh it's the, the, these are all kind of horrifying but in an entertaining way uh blood stained and aghast i mean all this language that's so th that that are kind of the clichés of that kind of um in this case literary entertainment uh although your rudder I, and actually kind of wonderful line your rudder be a dragon's tail long long severed yet still hard with agony um so uh you your th this is a hunt made out of uh, kind of horrifying elements, a, a, a ship that you make to, to hunt for a creature called the melancholy. And yeah, and then, and then Keats decided to cut that stanza. And I think um, maybe, um, uh, they were sort of cliches of the time already and that he didn't need to go into so much detail in, in that stanza and that it was enough to say, no, no, go not to Lethe. So Lethe is, is, is what? 
forgetfulness. It's the river of forgetfulness. So he's saying, don't, 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 don't go out of your way to, um, to, to forget this, this, these qualities, this element, uh, and that, um, that he didn't really need that extra stanza in this, in this hunt for melancholy, that he can actually get right to the point, he could get to the point quicker by using the, these other um, kind of cliches of the time, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade ruby grape or proserpine um uh that there's th there's almost a kind of religion in this make not your rosary of yew berries yew berries are yew trees are you know trees that grow in in cemeteries and this really has to do with stuff like you know reading a book or, or actually going out into a cemetery at midnight so you can feel scared. And that, you know, that, that then once it's over, you can, <laughs> uh, uh, th thank you, Jennifer. Um, um, and that there are kind of jokes uh, in here, let not the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche. So psyche is 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 is, is, is means the soul, and the soul is really a butterfly. Keats is actually making a little joke about don't don't let um don't let a moth be your butterfly. Um, uh, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. The and owl. then, and then... It's the owl. It's a harbinger. Yeah. Susan? Say it again. The owl Say is a harbinger of death, is it not? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what... Keats can do this more efficiently in this single stanza and then really get to the big point of the poem, which is in the last two lines of that first stanza. For shade to shade, so shades are, are, are ghosts. Shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. Wakeful, wakeful anguish. So that there's something, there's a difference between this kind of cultish literary entertainment, literary or even social entertainment where, you know, people would gather and do scary things at, at midnight. Um, and that's, that's trivial compared to the wakeful, the real anguish, what is tr real melancholia, what is true melancholy, what is true tragedy, um, the wakeful anguish of the soul. So there's the, the um, Uh, do, 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 do you see what I'm trying to yes. get out now, a, Catherine? A question for poets. How does he, uh, there's something in the cadence or the, so, that wakeful because, is the crescendo of those, the, of those two. How does he do that? Because it's just 
it could you could and drown the wakeful anguish of the, but no it's and drown the wakeful anguish that and he's making us feel that kind of, that makes you as he sees it alive to all the world yeah. how does he do it how does he what's the <laughs> trick here? <laughs> he's, a, he's a genius. Genius. Okay. But you see what I mean? Wakeful just leaps out of the um, iambic pentameter. Just. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, and that it's it's all this no, 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 go not yeah. to leave the neither twist. I mean, it's all this stuff. Make not your, ro your rosary of you berries nor let the beetle nor the all these negatives in that in 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 the in this first stanza in in the real first stanza yeah uh and then and then the opposite of that all this no 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 just a second when uh uh i see your hand that that it's the wakeful anguish, the wakeful anguish. That's the opposite of all these, no, 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 don't do this, don't do this. Uh, um, Jennifer, could you re re repeat that? I. Uh, this was just a, that I think that wakeful, partly jumps out of the line uh, because of the sound of the vowel. He's closed the mouth down and drowsily to drowse and then wake, <laughs> picks up the shade to shade, wake, we hear. I mean, I didn't want to get too technical, but I, I think we, it starts with shade to shade and then it closes down and drowsily and then it opens up in wakeful, and it's not just the A, but the ache, which is a sharper sound than those owls and those owns. Um, it, the, the pattern of the vowel music there helps single out the wake. And, and he really does that throughout this entire poem, that, the, that he, he is, that the, the, the words are so um, carefully chosen for what they sound like. Um, and, and we can talk about some of those other things uh, 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 afterwards also. Um, but but I think that's exactly right, that there's something and and I mean, you 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 also say you also say something that um, that I'm not sure I have ever actually quite taken in before, but that the word ache is in wakeful and that and that it has to do with not feeling an an an, an artificial pain but a wakeful ache when what what were you, you your your hand was up before and i i got well, sidetracked there's a, a couple of things <clears throat> in the first in the first in the first stanza we get Keats's knowledge of chemistry that is he was he was his apprenticeship so he goes through all of these lethal things you can take it's a contemplation a and, and and accuses suicide you know killing yourself by taking poison as a sentimental as a sentimentalizing of the horror of the world that he's that that goes through all of these right? right and 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 then the second then the second is his poetic therapeutic response to the to to actual to the actual when when it descends upon you like a weeping cloud what do you do you notice how beautiful the world is and and the the images are so the 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 rainbow the rainbow in the surf how 
pay attention to the to the right now it's i wow yeah delia we you're nodding uh, <laughs> happily well i this poem is just such a joy because of the music in it and <clears throat> it's it's a melancholy topic but we're just wallowing in this music i i i i love the in in we're coming to that to that second stanza where because the 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 the, the rhythm is is essentially iambic pentameter da 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 da, da, da with things that's that as as you yourselves have pointed out really kind of stand out i love the word sudden in line two of the second stanza because that's not iambic it's the opposite um it's the accent is on the first syllable so it's not but when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven and it's some it's more sudden because keats is actually playing with what you expect the rhythm is going to be you think it's going to be da 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 and then instead it's da 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 sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud and then the cloud i mean it's rain and you know we, there are a million clichés about rain being like tears but in this in this poem that that sense of grief um is more real because it's the opposite of something that's just sort of phony and i when i when wendell i love i love the way you use the word sentimental and and i think that's exactly right and that keats is saying you know we can be very sentiment we can be very sentimental about grief but that grief is not real grief is not sentimental real grief is devastating um hides the green hill in an april shroud i mean <laughs> he's really um he's talking about death and and that death isn't the kind of literary amusement that that is amusing in a book uh in a in a in a cheap novel uh or even a good novel but that there's something really much deeper than that that is where is that where he is going in 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 this poem um and and i think that is why he cut the he cut that first stanza uh that original first stanza that it's it's kind of it's jokey it's teasing um it goes on a little too long um and that to begin the poem really in this kind, kind of almost shocking way no no don't do this um that that's that's where the shock comes in and then in, and that the first stanza ends with that with that um wakeful wakeful anguish that is not in kind of literary entertainment but that is in nature in love in in the things that we experience in 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 real life
Um, could I could I cut in? There's uh, please. Jim has had his hand up for a long time now. Oh, please. There's, there's yeah, a little I, queue of people who would like to talk. Oh, please. <laughs> I you know I I I, I welcome that. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, Jim. Um, I was thinking that for our discussion, we don't need psychiatric or psychoanalytic understanding. We need literary understanding, uh, because I I think uh, the the point of this is, you know, that the melancholy uh, and the pain of it. Uh, leads us to the beauty and the sense, you know, it's it's loss, but the sense of loss le leads, of course, to the sense of life. Uh, I mean, it, in the uh, in the end, where uh, she dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, just a, a Freudian reference the, in his essay on transience, uh, Freud talks about uh, the sense of loss is what makes the makes the beauty beautiful. Uh, that the sense that we you know you don't get to hold on to it, and I think that's a lot of what the poem is about. That uh, you know that uh, it's the intensity of the melancholy makes us you know burst joy's grace uh, grape against the palate uh, fine. Uh, that you get to feel the juices of it, uh, you know, with the sense of loss. Uh, so that was my point. Thank you. Yeah. No. No. I. But that's. I think. I. 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 I completely. Uh, I. I completely agree with you. That. Um. You know. You can't. You can't taste that grape unless you destroy it. And. And. That's the. That's the kind of paradox. Yeah. Well, the destruction brings the Jews into the. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Jay. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Just, I mean, this is wonderful to kind of hear these comments and just to build upon that a little bit. Um, you know, the the word shroud. You know, that melancholy here is is both a destroyer and a reviver. And you know, you you pointed to wakeful, and it's to be awake, but also. Wake is also what one does over the body of the dead. And I, I can't read this without thinking that three or four months before, Keats had nursed his beloved youngest brother, Tom, to his death of tuberculosis, and undoubtedly had seen the body shrouded, had sat as a wake. And, and so I think, you know, we're sort of talking about the word that comes to mind here for me with Keats is courage, that the courage to go on and confront, you know, the, these terrible losses. Yeah, that, that, that these, that these, um, that there's something heroic about noticing these little things that are going to disappear in a moment, including his brother, his younger, his younger brother, yeah. Michael. I was thinking um, from what you and Denise have said about the first deleted stanza, that he's taking his own advice, that there's this hard work that he put in and beauty into that first stanza, but it doesn't quite fit. So he abandons it when he publishes yeah. and experiences the loss of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right, Stephen. Oh, am I muted? One second. No, you're not. Oh, <laughs> but your hand is up. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was just going to add when you were talking about the the start with the uh, the three uh, O sounds at the beginning of the poem, the no, no, no. By cutting that stanza, uh, he uh, this O is 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 directly to the reader. Uh, he's speaking. He's addressing us. The other odes are more um, uh, open. So by cutting the stanza, in a sense, he's implied that we, the listener, we've been saying all these things. We've been doing all these things as if in a dialogue with him. And he can say, but no, 
you, we have to back off from that. Here's why. So I just like the engagement of that because now we are a character uh, in this conversation, which is not true so much in the other odes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's right. We're 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 really being addressed very directly, and and it's no no no, don't do this. Um, was there someone else had a hand up? Um, 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 if if, if um, uh, there isn't anyone with a hand up, can I ask something, Lloyd? Please. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering whether the opposition you've constructed, which I hadn't hadn't really occurred to me previously, between um, an artificially um, engineered or instigated false inauthentic um, immersion in melancholy and then the real McCoy doesn't displace another more natural reading I, I've always tended to think that the the first stanza I didn't know about the um uh, the, missing. the uh the missing stanza I should say uh, so, so I, I I was proceeding on the basis of ignorance but um I, I've always assumed that it the first stanza was if I can paraphrase rather crassly, um, saying, don't try and retreat from your sorrow. Don't try and forget it, let alone commit suicide in order to escape from it. But rather, when it comes, immerse yourself in it because it's part and parcel of life. And indeed, it's intimately intertwined with beauty so that you won't be able to experience beauty fully unless you also embrace melancholy. So, but hasn't your reading, plausible and indeed persuasive as it is, in a sense displaced that, to me, still slightly more natural reading? Um, Are you with me? Oh. Yes, I am. I am. Um, but I would say I... I I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree, and I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Ah. But I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, there's something very, um, there's something very tricky about this poem, and and it's involved with the original first stanza, and then deleting the original first stanza, and um, I, I'm really. Um, I think because so many of us, <laughs> most of us are probably, you know, not readers of 18th century literature and ho horror literature and are not so up to date on 18th century, uh, you know, parties. Uh, that Keats is really um, uh, uh, that that's that's really sort of Keats's starting point, and it's clearer that that's his starting point when you when you actually read the stanza that he decided to delete, right. and that and that of course the 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 the, the central issue in this poem is 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 exactly what you uh is exactly what you say and um but i think um i i don't know i i i i i just wanted to um um uh, sort of demonstrate something about where this comes from in terms of in terms of literary history um yeah and I, I certainly think you're reading is um, makes sense of the poem as it stands. I mean, certainly it can appeal to the missing stanza I didn't know about, and that strengthens it the more. But it but it makes sense, I think, in relation to the poem as we typically experience it, because the the first stanza um, uh, is full of sort of mythic figures, and it uh, uh, you know Lethe and Proserpine and Psyche and what have you, and it's as if he's saying you know, ditch all that artificial machinery and yeah. engage more directly and freshly with a, 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 a lived and felt experience. Yeah, and I think that's that's absolutely the core of the poem. Right. That, that's absolutely the core of the poem and that, um, that uh, um, 
and 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 that this becomes increasingly intense as you read the poem. Um, uh, uh, that, um, you know, hiding the green hill in an April shroud, he's really not, he's not understating. Uh, he's really, he's really making you see what the, what the, what the real, what the central issues are. Your, your reading also enables us to give um, greater accent to fall, doesn't it? Fall now becomes an expression of the involuntary, that when it overtakes you unbidden, as opposed to being um, constructed rather willfully yes. in the first stanza. Yeah. There's, there's also this, this um, just this, you know, um, uh, I, you know, I want to say that I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of connect, um, pizzas. Uh, I, 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 I want to see, uh, what Sue, Sue Larson's, um, reaction to this is because I, I kind of connect Keats's odes with, um, Mozart operas. And I think, I think the ode on melancholy maybe is Keats's cozy fantute. Ah, you're thinking of the crunch cord. <laughs> yes. I... <laughs> the crunch cord in the trio. That's yes. true of most notes are. I mean, they, they, people have characterized them as laughing through tears and it's all very funny until it's not. Don Giovanni not. comes to mind. What do you mean by the crunch cord? Ah, ah, explain. A, you want to do it, Lloyd, or shall I? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I can't carry a tune, so you, ha you uh, have well, to do that. Yeah, we've discussed this before. There is a a beautiful trio in Act One of Così Fan Tutte, which, which is a farewell trio as the mm -hmm. heroes sail off into the to this fake war that they're faking going to, and <laughs> it's very earnest and and sort of light and sweet about sweet breezes, you know, blow my lover to safety. And then in the middle of it, there is a, there is a crunch chord, which is, you know, extremely dissonant chord. And you realize, yeah, they may die. We may die. I'm not, I, it, it's all over Mozart though. Even at his most lighthearted, there, is a, there are these dark places. In, in the production, I, in the great production that you were in, that Peter oh, Sellers yes. directed, uh, he has the, the 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 character Don Alfonso, who is plotting this trick on these uh, on the two sisters, and that crunch chord. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the, the character on stage actually covers his eyes yeah. at that moment when suddenly it's all a lot more serious and threatening than anyone than anyone in the audience even knew and it was hair raising absolutely absolutely hair raising and yeah that's mozart Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I think that Keats does that too. That that um, that um, he's not kidding. He's, he's joking in places, and he's playing around. Um, but he's also not kidding. Yeah. Uh, I. I, I, I I don't know the wealth of globed peonies. That you know what 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 peonies look like, and how it suddenly. I mean, wealth becomes such a loaded phrase, and glo globed globed. Uh, it, it's. It's it's also 
he notices everything. And really every, every word counts. Um, the wealth of globed peonies, rich anger, uh, feed, I mean, then we were talking about the sounds of the words, feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. It, it, it's suddenly you're, the, the person you are in love with, is kind of pulling you into their orbit, into their, into their existence in the, in the, in the deepest possible way. Um, uh, Jim, you, 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 we, we had a little conversation yesterday uh, about a certain ambiguity that comes up at the beginning of the next, um, uh, at the of the uh, the beginning of the last stanza, well, she dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. So the question is, who's which she is she? Yeah, and 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 and, and I think it's more than one. Uh, that it's at least two, well, and that it's it's <clears throat> the. It's the mistress, it's the girl, the girl who is sooner or later going to die. But it's also melancholy. Yep. Uh, and that there's this, this is kind of double, this, this, this double meaning going on. And, and, and it's, it's really both. Um, it's, it's, um, and, and, and I think, and Keats knows that, uh, Keats knows that there's this, that, that there is an ambiguity, that all of these beautiful things, these, these heartbreakingly beautiful things, these things that are just not going to last, even if you're someone you love just gets furious with you for a moment that that, that that's something that's already so precious and that um and that it's precious because it's it's not going to last either yep and joy go go on hmm? was that Susan were you going to say something i i was going to say how much i love and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu and aching pleasure nigh. It's so fabulous. And it it that's what spoke to me of uh, post-coital tristesse. Hmm. Yeah. Boy. Aching pleasure nigh. And even nigh is is it, it it's such a funny word. Uh I mean, you know, it could have been fear and near, but it's die and nigh. Mm -hmm. And 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 death is always nigh. Mm -hmm. Um turning to poison. I mean, John. Yeah, I, I really love the transition he makes from the last line of the second stanza to the first line of the third stanza, how he repeats the strategy of deep, deep, then beauty, beauty. It's as if he's sort of hammering the uh, the the uh, the nails into Christ's hand. That he's he's pounding it. But then he says also, "Must die." It's not shall die. It's not inevitable. It's imperative. It has to happen. And there's no way of avoiding it. And it's it's just sort of just reverberates at that point. I mean, it's, it's a real Mozartian moment. Another one in that way turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. I mean, it just, I, 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 I just find that breathtaking that- Yes. That, that- It's always, Lloyd, it's always been my, it's always been my absolute favorite image in the poem, the bee mouth. And honestly, it just stops me every time. I have no idea what it's doing there. I would love 
people to comment on that. It, it, it's the most incredible close up suddenly of a tiny mouth of a bee and the idea of the poison. What does, what, please speak to the bee. Um, any, 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 any responses to that? It, 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 Denise. Thank you. Well, um, the bees, bees sip sweetness. They, they pull the sweet fluids out of flowers. So the contrast there is, you know, it's possible to pull sweetness out of nature, out of the world, um, you know, e even if it's diluted and must be concentrated as the, as the bees do. So since that option is there, why would you go for the poison? That's simple-minded, but it's a possibility. Yeah. That's true, but Michael. also don't, don't bees metabolize oh. some of that into poison? So I think, make, what was that? Bees make poison in their bodies. Um, from the nectar. I think there's some sense that the bee's mouth is so small and the pleasure available to us is so great, we can only taste the tiniest bit of it. Um, what, in a sense, the bee is removing what the poison is what's left over after the bee <laughs> does what it does to make honey. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the, it's the remnant after the bee has 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 been in the flower. Yep, I, think so. uh, I also think that th th this is another one of those images of something fragile that's being used up turning to poison as the bee mouth sips. The, the bee is sipping from the flower, but then, then there is nothing more. D Denise, I'm not sure whether you're agreeing with me or disagreeing with me. Well, the, the bee may exhaust one flower, but then the bee goes on to other flowers, you know, as the there as the the peonies, just to use his image, are are global yeah, yeah. and great. But you know, you only get them in May, but then there's new flowers in the summer and new flowers in the fall, and the bees love all of them. But isn't this also a reference to beauty that must die as he sips the nectar out of the out of the flower then the flower in a sense dies uh, and that this is another reference to the transience of uh, uh of you know what he's describing it's true i don't flowers. think so the bee the the flower survives to feed another bee that um the flower will go on producing nectar i think david's reading is the more plausible, the, the bee is making honey, which is not toxic, but it also makes uh, yeah. it's makes a toxin or um, an allergen, at least, uh, with its stinger. Because uh, otherwise, it's really kind of hard to make sense of that phrase. But I, it 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 has to do with being with being stung, yeah. Um, and um, yeah. And then 
then this um sorry someone said something interesting no i i couldn't hear um um then this the the the, the, the sort of final twist in the poem in the very temple of delight that's where the deepest melancholy is um uh, oh i'm sorry I see some there's uh, several people have their hands have their hands up uh susan and then um uh ruth and peter a uh, peter yeah peter yeah so um I had a question around the gender of um, melancholy being she and joy being he. Hmm. Is there some sort of um, tradition to that or? The, 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 the melancholy is, is, is always a goddess. Uh, joy as as male i'm not so sure about about that although maybe it's he it's keats identifying with because the, then you have you have those the he and the she in conflict with each other right um His show. Yeah. Um, so she's the figure. I mean, she's the figure that is going to die. And and melancholy. Th this 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 temple of melancholy is is also the, to, the, 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 the tomb of melancholy. And, and that the joy, the joy that he, Keats, is who is a votary in this, in this temple. And, and that, um, and that, the joy is always disappearing. It may be, maybe it's renewing itself, but it's also disappearing. So. Well, it's all going to die. We're all going to die. It's, yeah. Everything's going to die. Yeah, but, right. But I'm trying to understand the, the use of gender as enhancing the imagery, and I, I can't quite find it. Um. Jay, you? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I'm, 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 I don't know if anyone else kind of makes this association, but in this last section, um, you know, the melancholy as as a goddess with a hidden shrine into which the hero has ventured and where he apparently is now destroyed. He is now hung, and I, I couldn't help thinking of of Titian's. Diana and Actian that we, so many of us I'm sure saw at the Gardener and whether or not Keats would have seen that painting, though it's in London today, he certainly knew Ovid. And it feels like there's that, that may be a story that's kind of lurking underneath here, um, melancholy as a destroyer and, and life giver. Yeah, I thought of that also. <laughs> um... Uh, because that, that it's also the shrine, her shrine, and um, yeah. Well, these are all all good questions. Aching, aching pleasure nigh. So, so melancholy is 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 the sovereign, is the power. Um, 
Veil Melancholy has her sovereign shrine. And then uh, I, I actually think the, the these next couple of lines uh, um, oh, I want to come back to that. I, I, I think these, these, these next couple of lines, um, just seem like, you know, some of the most amazing lines, of uh, 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 poetry, uh, in existence. And, and that has to do with the, with the sounds, with the sounds of the words and that, um, Veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine, though, and, and, and I'm thinking of the, the N sounds and the NG sounds and the, um, and the, the NY sounds. In the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has her sovereign sovereign shrine though seen of none sovereign shrine none save him whose strenuous tongue uh i mean you know if if you were going to say that line out loud with a grape in your mouth you're gonna that grape is going to be gone because you're you're pressing the grape against the roof of your mouth with those sounds, the strenuous tongue, sovereign shrine, those seen, those seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. Um, so it's the joy i mean i guess you know it it it's keats's joy and uh she dwells with beauty beauty that must die but she but he he is feeling the joy that isn't going to last and joy whose hand is ever at his lips, bidding adieu and aching pleasure nigh. Um, uh, can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. His soul, the person, the person who is devouring this joy his soul shall taste the sadness of her might. Sadness and might. And be among her cloudy trophies hung. So he's, you know, he, he is the receiver of the pleasure, but he is also the victim. And so... D Denise, what? Oh, sorry. Um. Uh, any <laughs> any 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 other comments? Um. Yeah, Louis. John. Just a, a, an observation about how the poem starts, and I'm so glad that first stanza was removed. But it's uh, I think what we did to the poem or Keats asked of us is to go emotionally slumming. Which I think is a great phrase, emotionally slumming. How do you, how do you mean? Oh, it's, it's, it's uh, like I'm watching a movie on the Hallmark Channel. They're so sentimental and so, so uh, um, easily simply defined that to me, it's a kind of emotional pornography. So that falls in the same category as the emotional slumming. But, but what, what, what's, what's the, what's the slumming in this poem? Is it, is it, 
Oh, no, it's it, just the beginning of it. It's, it's, oh, it's yeah. what you oh, talked oh, yeah. about, oh, yeah. is like right. to going to these parties and sort of, uh, you know, putting your finger in the light socket to sort of get that jolt that we're slumming in order to get the thrill of it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Tintern Abbey and, you know, people people making these expeditions to see yeah. this old ruin and and you know and you you of course you can go you can go d during the day but it's really it's way creepier if you go at night yeah and and um well that becomes literary slumming yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but that the poem is you don't do that the poem is 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 looking for is looking for the you know the real feeling and yeah. the, 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 the the real tragedy and the real heartbreak uh, it's an instruction in a way about how to be present for that yes. those difficult feelings yeah yeah it that that's that that that's right don't do it this way do it do do it the way i'm i'm advising you to um this is this this is where it really counts this is where it really matters and it's and he may be talking to himself a little bit here too the you of address oh yeah Oh, I'm sure. I, I I'm sure. I'm sure he he is. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I mean, you've given us some. We all have some things to think about. Um. What is that bee doing? Um. Um, but um, um, it's anticipating a strenuous tongue, isn't it? And in, in the yes, zoom it, in, <laughs> yeah, but but that it's also. Um, kind of uh, to see this um, metaphor as fellatio. No, I don't see. Oh, I don't know. I don't think I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I was thinking nobody did. Um, um, did I return? I, I, go ahead. I just, um, this is leaving the bee um, behind. I just okay. want to re return to your central opposition between um, the the artificial and the authentic, and um, I, 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 uh, and the way in which that's reflected in um, the inclusion of lots of mythic figures in the um, first stanza when um, uh, he, he's conjuring the artificial experience, and and they are then jettisoned. Um, uh, as he moves towards the more authentic one, but he still retains, um, you, you know, the figure of Prosopopoeia a great deal, doesn't he? It's, it, you know, these big abstractions which are given agency. And, uh, and uh, Prosopopoeia was the, the figure which um, uh, Wordsworth particularly banned and proscribed in the um, preface to lyrical ballads. And I, I know Keats never ever approaches, um, you know, a Wordsworthian uh, uh, colloquialism or um, conversationality. <laughs> but um, it's a, 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 um, in a way, um, I, I sort of half feel that um, the retention of um, these sort of high-sounding and literary figures um, uh, is intention is um, intention with your claim that the authentic versus the the artificial is the central opposition I, I, I don't know if you you catch any of that sense or
Um, it still it still feels um, you you the kind of thing you've been saying about the last stanza is that this is um, uh, an exhortation to um, engage in real experience as distinct from the um, yeah. literary contrived factitious experience evoked earlier, and yet um, there is a remarkable literariness, especially when one invokes Wordsworth as a um, an alternative. Um, a remarkable literariness about that claim to escape from the merely literary. That's what I'm sort of getting at. I, you, you make me think uh, of, of uh, you know, maybe the most famous uh, of Keats's own literary phrases, which is which is negative capability, which has certainly been written about. A million, a million times. It's a, it's, it, it's, it's in a letter that he wrote to his friend. Yeah. And, and, as, as I understand it, it's, it's the, the ability to really have more than one feeling at the same time, and that the feelings can be opposite, even. And they can still be simultaneous. So, so here there's a kind of a, an aversion to the literary and simultaneously an attraction to it, and they keep company despite their apparent oppositionality. Yeah, well, you know, he he wants to be a poet. <coughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You know, he wants to be a poet, and he's read poetry, and he's read Ovid, and he's read. Um, Wordsworth, <laughs> um, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking at the, that 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 really kind of what's behind. I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going back to the to the B mouth, and that it's. You know, it, it 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 probably has nothing to do with bees, and and that it it has to do with tasting beauty, and that the beauty is going to be gone, and that. The poison is that, you know, you 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 you, you can't just live on these the the, the 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 morning rose, the peony, the 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 grape, all of these things are gonna be gone. Nothing is going to last, and that that um, uh, that that's the dilemma that we're all in. That the 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 negative capability, the 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 that we're feeling we're 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 feeling opposite things at the same time and that doesn't make one of them more valuable than the other they're both quintessential um and i don't I, I, you know, I don't know. How, I, I, I don't know how else to, uh, uh, to 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 explain. No, no, that was good. Um, um, the o the only thing that will last is the poem. Yeah, you hope it will. He hopes it will. <laughs> he hopes it will, and w w it's lasted so far. It's lasted so far. Well, this has been 
I, it's just been a, uh, I, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, I, I, I think it's a challenging poem. I, I, I love it. Um, and, uh, I, I, um, could, could I just one other thing, um, Lloyd, um, uh, yeah. I, I very much enjoyed your reading and um, Jennifer's contributions to your reading of um, the Marianne Moore last month and was hoping to revisit it, but I don't think it appeared online. Is that the case? Oh, um, I don't know. Derek, is 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 the is the Marianne Moore discussion, uh, is that going to be available um, to us? at yes. any point yeah so we we have recorded it like we record all of these sessions and we're going to be putting it online um i can email it to everyone once we do just so you know oh great thank you thank you thank you and and we we we're just getting to know you and we're gonna miss you yeah um oh. this is derek from the malden library who is who is, who is going back to school? Oh, right. good. Thank you. Good, good. Yes, and good luck, and um, and thank you so much for for. Sorry, it hasn't lasted longer, but but you can come, That's you can what come we're back. Talking about isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, right. it is. Exactly, exactly. But please, please feel free to visit whenever whenever you can yeah i'll make sure to I'm, stop by i'm not i'm not taking you off the mailing list no <laughs> and thank you thank you everyone it's great to see you all i hope you're all well and um and thank you for for joining us and you know once more you've given me more to think about than <laughs> than than um than i expected <laughs> thank you um, take care everyone so long thank you oh there's still some people there <laughs> Well, Derek, again, thank you. And I, I will, um, I'm going to try to um, come by uh, may, maybe on Tuesday. Sure. It would, be it would be nice to meet you in person. I know, I know. I feel like this is um, such a special community, you know. It, there